Welcome to the Open Mic Podcast Show with Mike Midgley. Hey and welcome to the Open Mic Podcast, episode 16. And in today's episode, we're going to be discussing a topic that every business owner should have the top of their agenda, and that's storytelling through marketing. So creative, engaging copy that tells stories is one of the most worthwhile investments a business can make. And I know you might be thinking and sat there say, hey, I can write my copy myself and nobody knows my business more than I do. So surely I'm the best person to write copy uh, and tell stories about my business. Then I've got a big, strong, sharp message for you. And that's how wrong you are, how wrong you are. The value of a copywriter who can fuse stories and really bring what value you deliver to the market to life is worth the weight in gold. And, uh, you know, the fusing of that story, connecting with your audience. Too many business owners, in my view, as I've always looked at this, is that they're talking about themselves or the product and not thinking about their audience. Um, and as I say, copywriters are worth the weight in gold and it's a skill that few of us possess. So in this episode, I'm really excited to be joined by Rob Drummond. Hi, Mike. How are you doing, Rob? You're all right? I'm great, thank you. Yeah. And Rob, you. Brilliant. And Rob runs a couple of uh, businesses, Confusion Clinic, and is also the founder of True Storytelling. And we're going to find out a little bit more about that. And it's, as you share your secrets on crafting stories into, uh, <laughs> into marketing. Um, so as we move forward, thanks for being on the show, Rob. Um, copywriting is a passion of mine, and it has been for a while. Um, am I any good at it? Probably not. I'm in the minority. Uh, so I'm really looking to learn out of this as well. Uh, so welcome to the show, and I really appreciate the time. Um, so just sort of tell us uh, a little bit about you uh, in your own words. I've got a little bit of a bio, and obviously I've known you from when we first met over in Manchester at one of the Infusionsoft events. Um, but I notice on your business profile and on your website, you're a binge uh, consumer of documentaries. And uh, as a conspiracy theorist and X-Files geek myself, um, I'm up for a little bit of that, although I don't watch a lot of TV. But there's a lot more to you than just a binge consumer of documentaries, I trust you. So tell the audience a little bit about you, uh, who you are, what you do, and your expertise. That's right. So the elevator pitch I normally give people is that I help people who do great work to tell better stories about what they do. So that's, that's a short snippet, but obviously there's a lot more behind it like, uh, than that. I, I, I rode down on a, on a motorbike today. Um, I like to take long walks. Uh, there's all sorts of things uh, in my backstory that I might be able to tell you in my marketing. <laughs> um, but it's really knowing what to select and when. Uh, yeah. So what, what I do is I help people select, okay, you've got this big mess of a story. How do we pick the right parts to tell that are going to build trust and close sales? Um, if it's all right with you, Mike, um, I thought I would tell you a bit about my, my journey to what, what I do. Perfect. Moment, yeah. yeah, because I think when the people who guest on the show and the influencers who come on, and we certainly class you in that bracket, Rob, is um, the, the noise out there on the channels. People have got choice of whether they choose to listen or not. And, you know, you, you're tuning into the podcast for a specific reason. You want to learn something. You want to be educated. You want to show. And... Um, when you look at Rob's experience and his journey, it's pretty phenomenal. So you might just want to buckle up and uh, if you seriously want to get better conversions, better copy, uh, Rob's going to share some awesome uh, examples with you. So over to you, Rob, and just share us a little bit more about you and that journey. Sure. So my journey actually started and finished in the same place. So my first job after university was for a CRM company, which in our world stands for Customer Relationship Management. Yeah. Which is basically a fancy name for a customer database. So, you know, Salesforce, Infusionsoft, HubSpot, all CRM systems. So, I was doing a marketing job for a firm in London uh, called Prospectsoft. Yep. And um, which was a great experience. Like, we used to do everything in the marketing team. Like, we used to like, write the mailers, stuff the envelopes. Like, you haven't, you haven't really learned about marketing unless <laughs> you're, you're stuffing stuff envelopes. You've got to stuff the envelopes. Then it occurred to me later, like, we could have paid someone else to do that. But. <laughs> Yeah, we've got a policy in our business as well, Zoe, just to interrupt, that if there's any task that's £12 or $15 an hour for our US listeners, it goes on somebody else's desk. Because we, it's not just me, but the, the core team here, we just can't afford to do it. It's got to go on there because yeah. we could be far more effective in, in other areas. You've seen about graph translations earlier. <laughs> exactly. yeah. It's like, why am I writing all this time? Absolutely. Um, but yeah, so, so it was a great experience. Um, after about four years in the bowl, I, I kind of felt like I kind of stagnated. You know, you've just been in a role for a while, you're kind of going through the motions, you're not really learning anything new. And I, I, I was following people like Perry Marshall at the time and some other high profile marketers. And then I went out for a meal with my then girlfriend, my now wife, Lindsay, and I said, look, I think I'm just going to like, hand in my notice. And she was very concerned, you know, she was like, well, how are we going to pay the rent? And I was like, well, 
how hard could it be? You know, it'll be all right. <laughs> I'll just work for myself. So I left work, set out as, uh, at the time, I was called RJD Consulting, which was my first business day. Very corporate. Very corporate, yes. Selling SMS text messaging services wow. to local businesses, which in hindsight was a great idea that nobody wanted. Yeah. But at the time, you know, it felt really good. Like set off, I set off as like an independent you know, business person. I was under my own steam, whatever. And then I quickly ran out of money, yeah. <laughs> and I ended up getting really desperate. And it was kind of like it was a good time, but it was a dark time as well. Yeah. And I ended up walking around shops. So I used to live down there, London. Yeah. So I was walking around shops in High Wycombe and Beaconsfield, asking shop owners if they wanted to speak to me about SMS text messaging, which the answer, of course, was no. no. <laughs> And, uh, but I spoke to uh, a guy in a hair salon, having to be the business owner, and he, and he said to me, no, it's okay, I've, I've, uh, my, my accountant already deals with all of my taxes. And I said, I said to him, no, no, not, not taxes, <laughs> text messaging, you know, like, like, like on your phone. And he goes to me, well, I don't think I really need that. But can you get me wrapped on Google, you know, in, in the Google rankings? And, you know, I did this kind of notch look yawn and was like, yeah, of course, yeah, of course I, can. I can do that. So, yeah, a lead, I've got it. <laughs> so we, we arranged a meeting uh, a week or so later and I came back in my suit with my laptop that I still had from my previous company. Yeah. And uh, we perched on a bench in this hair salon and there's people around us like having their hair dry, like in the, in the dryers. A really not a conducive place to do work. No, 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 exactly. Um, and I showed them this website that I mocked in WordPress. Yeah. And he said, it's, it's very nice. How much is it going to cost? Yeah. And I did the, you know, the car salesman thing of like stuck it into my teeth. Like, well, you know, it's going to be so many pounds, so many yeah. pounds. And I was so 300 pounds. Yeah. And he goes, 300 pounds? Uh, that's, that's far too expensive. I've had, yeah. I've had uh, quotes in the past for 100 pounds. Yeah. So, uh, which obviously for everyone listening is, is stupid, you know. It's bonkers money. It's it? bonkers, yeah. But anyway, that, that's also led me down the path of being a web designer, <laughs> which I thought was the right path at the time. Yeah. It turns out it wasn't. And um, a friend at the time advised me to get in contact with some local networking groups. So I contacted one and they got back to me and said, we're, you know, we're really sorry, but we've already got a web designer. Yeah, because a lot of them here, especially for the, the foreign listeners, and I'm not quite sure if it's the case, but you know, certainly um, the BNI is one example of that, but where they, they, they allocate a category yes. and you, you can't... You have one plumber, one car. You can't infiltrate if there's already somebody in there. So it can be frustrating if it's the right audience for you as well. So yep. you, you, you had knockback after knockback here. So I, I, you know, I did the same thing. I yawned nonchalantly, said, what is it you'd like to hear about? <laughs> so they said Google AdWords. So I got, hastily got some cards printed on Vista Prince, like Rob, Drum <laughs> Rob Drummond's Google AdWords expert. Expert. Yeah. I went along at seven o'clock in the morning to, to talk about my budding yet non-existent AdWords agency. Yeah. And I managed to pick up a few AdWords clients and it was, you know, it was going quite well for a bit. Um, like, you know, I took a lot of the lessons that Perry Marshall teaches yeah. and, and kind of built out campaigns. Um, and then what would happen was I get a phone call one day from the clients and would say, we're really sorry, Rob, but these, I mean, to my eyes, the conversion, the numbers were good. We were generating leads, we were generating conversions. And then I get these phone calls and a bit of clients and they say, you know, these, these leads, they just haven't gone anywhere. And I'd be like, did you not phone them up? <laughs> did, did you actually go to see them? <laughs> yeah, <it wasn't. laughs> you know, there was too much, there was too much beyond the conversion that was beyond my control. Yeah. And I noticed at the time that two of my most interesting clients that took marketing automation most seriously used Infusionsoft. Yeah. I was like, well, you know, that's, that's quite interesting. So I made the decision at that point to get involved in Infusionsoft. Yeah, and get certified. And get certified. Um, I put out a message to Perry Marshall's forum and said, look, I'm looking to get to learn this. Um, did anyone like some help? A few people got back to me and kind of since, in, since then, you know, I've done just about every job you can imagine in Infusionsoft. I think that's a great thing. And for anybody just wanting to get started out there, it doesn't matter if you're in the digital space, you're in bricks and mortar or anything like that, but there's a lesson there. Just, I just want to bring it out there, Rob, and I hope you don't mind me re-emphasizing this point, but for the listeners, listen to the journey that Rob's taken. You know, he, he's, he's, he's forced the market, he's put himself out there in somewhat desperate circumstances in the earlier days. He's listened to his audience and he's found out what they want instead of sort of pushing at them what he, th they, he thinks that they want. And that's a great, great skill. If you're out there just saying, you know, I'm a plumber and all I want to set is plumbing uh, information, then ultimately um, think about what your audience wants and you've done the hard yards, Rob. And, you know, you've sort of, 
not said I'm just going to be a copywriter or I'm not going to be a storyteller or I'm not going to be in a marketing automation. You've, you've sort of worked through the, 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 the ladder and the snake pit of that to get to a situation where ultimately you found yourself uh, sort of settling, which we're going to get to in a moment with your expertise and what you actually now love. So I just wanted to bring that. I hope you don't mind me sharing that again, Rob, because sometimes when we talk about stories, uh, of the journey of our uh, influencers and our guest contributors. Not everybody sort of sort of pays a lot of attention to these. Yeah, and you know, I, I get some feedback on some of the channels, which if you've got any messages for Rob or myself about this subject, you can use the hashtag the open mic or hashtag growth engine on Twitter, which is our preferred communication channel. If you're watching this on YouTube or the blog, leave us a comment below, we can get that answered for you as well. But sometimes a lot of people skip through that, but there is a lot of gold in these intros and listening to the influencers journeys, you know, and they're not all, you know, mega stars today and YouTube stars today and top of the game today, you know, they've done the hard yards. So if you're out there, one, stick at it, Two, but listen to your audience. Three, you know, force the market. And, and, and finally, you'll, you'll probably end up building a product or a service out of multiple pieces that, you know, ultimately gets and, and sets you out, you know, unique. So apologies for cross-bowing you there, uh, Rob, but I just want to make sure that the audience is clear that, you know, you don't always start out as a copywriter or you don't always start at that. And, you know, and it, neither is it easy. There's some hard yards to it's like It's like spinning a Rubik's Cube around to find the right combination that works for you. And you have to learn about yourself fundamentally. Because otherwise you're following someone else's strategy that might work for them. But is it going to work for you? Is it going to play to your strengths? And then sometimes you just don't gauge the market correctly as well. Yeah. Yeah, um, you get it wrong. So yeah, I ended up sort of getting into, into infusion stuff, but what I realized really was that despite all my kind of dalliances with different things, it was really, what really mattered was the quality of the database and the importance of story and narrative. Mm -hmm. those, those were the things that you really needed. If you had, if you had the right database and the right systems and then the right message, you generally do all right. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I found since. So on that um, point, I, mess, I referenced one, um, I can't remember if it was last week or the week before where we did a podcast. And I referenced Dan Kennedy. Uh, and I remember when I bought my first ever copy of Magnetic Marketing or way back when. Uh, by the way, guys, if anybody's listening and not got a copy of that and you're interested in marketing or at least copy, go and buy it. You, know, you go to gkic.com. That's gkic.com. Uh, take a look at that. Uh, magnetic marketing uh, i think it's only about two or three hundred dollars and you know it, it's worth its weight in gold but there was like a picture of a triangle uh in the magnetic and this wasn't a high production rob if you've seen that it's just like literally photocopies out of dan kennedy's filing cabinet really rough all the copies in an old binder with a few dvds or cds uh, and there was like a triangle and it was message market media. Uh, and he says, you know, people go straight to media and they're trying to get it out there, but they don't understand the marketplace and they don't understand the message that they're trying to create before they go to media. Correct. And that always sort of sticks out. And I can more or less visualize that yeah. black and white copy of this triangle, you know, with market message and media on there. People start with the tools and actually the tools are the last thing and actually you need to figure out who it is you're trying to speak to and then what the message and story is first. And yeah, absolutely. Are fine. Um, so yeah, I, I ended up kind of, I've always written kind of story-based emails. Like even when I was doing AdWords, it was really like a front-end sale and I was writing email sequences. But I never thought I could teach other people how to tell stories. Like it seems like a bit of a dark art to me. Mm -hmm. And then um, I went to a workshop by, have you heard of a guy called Sean D'Souza? No, I haven't. Okay. Uh, no, I haven't. But um, we'll, um, give, we'll, we'll check that out and we'll give him a credit. Yeah, his website's uh, psychotactics.com. And he put on a storytelling workshop in Amsterdam. And we all, um, about 20 of us, we all arrived, mostly as writers, like a few copywriters, a few authors. And then um, I quickly realized that Sean had arrived with a process that he was able to teach. And it wouldn't have mattered if we'd have all have shown up as architects or engineers really? or rocket scientists or whatever. But they've all have gone through, but they've all have made the same mistakes and came away with the same skills. Right. And I thought that was really empowering because, and I was like, well, it's actually, scalable as well. It's scalable. Course. And it, it, it made me realize. It wasn't just you go, you get pumped up full of air and notes and you come away and you don't do anything. You can't it's, like, on it. it's like you come away with a skill. And um, I, I got back and I, you know, it just really kind of stuck with me. And I, I took Sean's process and I, I did some ideas on my own. You know, as you said earlier, you, you take someone's idea and you mix it with some of your own ideas. Absolutely. Just off of that, we, that's a conversation me and Rob had off air. But here at The Successive, we've got um, you know, quite a few structured you know, uh, inbound growth plans and growth engines. And, you know, they're, they're usually made up of seven components, four strategy and three execution. Um, and when I actually look at that, yeah, there's all the, you know, years of experience that we have as a team here. 
But I actually look at this stuff in there from Digital Marketer, this stuff in there from HubSpot, this stuff in there from Don Miller, this stuff in there from Dan Kennedy, all the copywriters, this stuff in there from Harvard Business or HBR from Strategic. So it's a cobble up of all the experiences, what works and how you can deliver it and what you're comfortable with, isn't it? And, and, and that's another great tip for the listeners. If you're sat there trying to just make one you know, vanilla product, it's going to be very hard to differentiate yourself. Whereas you know, if you learn and draw in from some of the experiences that you learned, and as long as you're not ripping people off and you know you're giving credit where credit's due but make them your own add value and you can really start to craft a really compelling product that you know or service that people want i think the real asset test of it is then when you go and teach it to someone and can they then when you taught it to them can they go and explain it to someone else yes so i got back and i ran a six week i called it a work group which yeah. wasn't wasn't a great term for it but <laughs> i managed to get three people to to spend six weeks online with me working through this process and about halfway through i said okay off you go, write me an email. Yeah. And there was this eerie silence on, on Zoom, or go to yeah. meeting, whatever we were using. And they all got stuck. Yeah. And I, I realized that you know we, we needed extra steps in the process. And I wouldn't have realized that if I hadn't taught it to them. So that was, that was uh, three years ago now, maybe two and a half years ago. And then since then, the process, like the, the copy process hasn't really changed too much. I've, I've added in some different kind of takes on it. I've actually got away and studied lit, like a lot of books and literature and study, well, what is, what is co the commonality among the great stories and how can we apply that to the stories that we're telling in our marketing? Yeah. That's kind of the, the newer developments, I guess. Brilliant. Um, yeah, and that, that's mostly brings us up, up to date. Um, fantastic. I mean, it's a fantastic journey, Robert. As somebody who, you know, I know the word entrepreneur gets thrown around and it gets thrown around like loose change, you know, uh, for me. And, and I, I take offense to it when people say, oh, I'm going to be an entrepreneur, or I am an entrepreneur or whatever. To me, and I know I'm going to be radical about this and, you know, you're more than happy to open a dis debate with us if you want to shoot us a message on Twitter with hashtag the open mic or hashtag growth. Edit. But I think entrepreneurship, people are born in that vein. I don't think you can be created or manufactured entrepreneur. You might not know you want, and you might have to go through some of the knocks and the hard yards that you went through, certainly, before you get into that entrepreneurial sort of spirit uh, and you find your level. But I think it's a specific type of person who, and I use this regularly, and I probably use it in most shows when I talk about entrepreneurs, where you choose to work 80 hours a week uh, for half the pay for mm -hmm. what you could work 40 hours a week for somebody else for. It, it's that sort of mental like sort of- Hard and happy. Yeah, absolutely. But you do what you love. And for me, you know, 24, 25, 26, 27, whatever years it is now as an entrepreneur, yeah, 91. And I'm recording date of this, if you're listening back, it's 2018, August. So 27 years as an entrepreneur. I've never really worked for anybody since then and been through the highs and lows. So to hear your story, it, it, it's heartwarming. And, and, you know, all to the fact that I'm, I'm so appreciative of you sharing that because, you know, not being able to pay the rent, guys. How many of you guys are out there in that situation right now? but you either sat there thinking about it, you sat there complaining about it, or you're on the job boards. What Rob did is he got his backside out there and walked to the streets and basically door knocked his shops and said, can I help you? With a product in his right hand, and then when everybody said no, when somebody asked him about a product that he didn't even think about in his left hand, he said, yeah, I'll do that. It's all of the link forwards always happen when you get out and speak to people. Yeah, of course so it does. Amazing, yeah. Of course it does. So I'm really appreciative of you sharing that story about your, your, back, your back story and your journey, and uh, well done, and congratulations for sticking at it. And uh, yeah. without asking, you're going to go a lot further than you already are um, and not that I'm the judge of, of, of success um, but moving on and let's get back to the subject uh, of storytelling in marketing Rob um, we, we've touched on it and we've given some examples and we've both shared some experiences and some references um, but if I get straight to it if I were to say when we think of stories in copy you know, it's not always obvious, you know, in nature. So my question to you is, well, I'd love you to share your experience with the audiences. Why do stories work? I think you have to ask. So in terms of the way that we perceive and view the world, we have this kind of moving series of images in our brains. Yeah. And we essentially perceive the whole world as a story. So if I told you about how I got here today, I got up this morning, I had breakfast, I got my motorbike, I drove 30 miles. Yeah. You know, it's not the most interesting story, but it is a story. And, it's, and, it's, and you have these images in your head of me doing these, doing these different things. Yeah. So, so every, every person in your, in your audience has these moving series of images going on in their head. And you can either, you can either tap into that or you can try to swim against it. Yeah. And it's far easier to try to and tap into, into it. it, to go into it and essentially join in the, join in the conversation that's going on in their head, which yeah. basically is a story. So um, I, I was saying before, I, I really like um, 
Donald Miller's analogy, where a story is like music. If yeah. you think about a piece of classical music, it has tone, it has structure, um, it has something that, like, as you're listening to it, you're almost kind of future pacing what's, what's coming up. Whereas when you just blast out information, you know, there's a lot of marketing which is just blasting out content and information, but it's not music, yeah. it's just noise. And there's, there's no, there's nothing coherent about it. Whereas the thing that's really important about the story is it makes you, it makes you pick what you think is important. Because the story can only be about one thing, really. So you're forced to say, okay, I'm going to tell you. So I told you the story before about my journey into CRM. Yep. I could have told you a story about a million other things, but I didn't think it was as important. So you focused on that one point. You focused on that thing. So it's picking that particular thing that when you think about your audience and where they're at and what decision, you know, what story is going on in their head, um, it forces you to pick that particular thing. The other, thing, the other reason why a story works is when it's told well and when it's told fully, it has an element of completeness. Yes. It has, it has, a, it has a before, a middle, and an end. Yeah, so I think, I mean, Don Miller, you mentioned earlier. So again, if you're not familiar with Don Miller, you can check out his business at storybrand.com, which I think is, um, you know, something you can sort of take there, Donald Miller. Uh, but I think he references the analogy of uh, like a three-part play, doesn't he, where there's a beginning of the play, the middle of the body, and the end of it. And uh, I always remember it as a three-part play that we see in the theatre. Most stories are actually about, I mean, most of the stories that last, um, and this applies for films or movies, but it also applies for stories you're telling in marketing. They're always about personal change and personal growth. Yeah. So you start off in one situation and then you have this kind of tumultuous period in the middle where you, when you learn something about yourself, you reassess and you reemerge as a more full and more complete version of yourself, with a better understanding of yourself. Yeah. And then that is the point of the story. And the reason that we do these things is because that transformation that you go through your audience are also looking for that transformation and that's why it works. That's yeah. why it gets people. No, that's, that's awesome. That, that's really uh, important. So think about the stories and, you know, uh, we may cover this later on, Rob, so if I'm hijacking the agenda, I apologize. But I always think about if, even if you just take it away from business at the moment, put it back into family, put it back into your social circle. And remember that time. Now, I'll let you fill in the blank what that time is. It could be, you know, you went on holiday, uh, you know, you and your mates were down the pub, uh, you had the bouncing ring, bouncing boxing ring in your back garden, and fill in the time, it, it doesn't really matter. What do you remember? You always remember that one point when, you know, he, he fell off the side of the boat. Is that, and, and it's, so it's, you know, did we have a great time in Greece? Yeah, we did. But do you remember when Rob yeah. fell off the side of the boat? Yeah. That's the story that people sort of zone into. And I think that's a little bit of what you said about focus on one thing, but also why stories work because that's what you read you know you, you never say what how great the hotel was as much as when rob fell off the side of the boat or whatever it was it's, it's that point i really think that businesses don't have problems but people have problems yeah so then when you pull them out into the open and you deal with them and you talk about them um and actually when you talk about them in a, in a vulnerable way that doesn't you know present you as perfect yeah. people see their own flaws and your flaws and actually that's that's the basis of how we build trust with people yeah so if you want to sell expensive stuff well you've got to build a relationship with people first yes. you, you have to be telling your story oh, absolutely no that's great and thanks for that so i think moving on um my view is the framework is obviously key to any successful strategy in business um so uh, big credit out to brad martineau at six division that you'll know of from the infusionsoft space and, and things like that uh, we even have him on our wall of appreciation here because he, he has this pursue simple sort of statement uh, that he, he bands around a lot of, a lot but the the favorite sort of um statement that I like what Brad Martineau uses is strategy precedes everything. Mm -hmm. So strategy precedes everything. So when I look back at my sort of career way before Infusion Self, way before Six Division ever came out of the, the gate, and before I heard Rob say, uh, sorry, um, Brad Martineau say that, um, I think about how I've used strategy to build businesses, grow them, exit them, and all that type of things. So for me, strategy is key, key, key. And a lot of people who come in here, I always bring strategy to the table. So Moving forward, the framework to any sort of successful strategy. So for me, explain this four types of story that you talk around. Sure. So when we start to think about storytelling, I think people assume that you, you have to, you know, lay your life on the line and tell your, tell your personal story. And there's a risk that, there's a risk that you overshare and yeah. that you tell too much. Okay. Um, so when I sort of drill down into this, um, I, I basically analyze that there's actually four different types of story that we can tell. Yeah. And, this, and they're useful for different circumstances. So if you have um, more of a known service, so if you're a plumber or a carpenter or something, something that people search for on Google, then uh, you're probably going to tell different types of story. So if you are an educator, if you're a trainer, um, then, you, then you probably have to tell more of your own stories. So yeah. 
So the four types of story are uh, product stories, so stories about how your product came to exist. Yep. Customer stories. Yeah. So people who so a product and a customer story are very similar, but a customer story tells it from the experience of the user. Yeah, and, and, the, and, the, and the benefit or the, the, yes. the result that they've got. Yes. Yeah. Those two stories are the most common yeah. and the most easy to tell. They don't stress in you very much to tell them. Yeah. People expect you to tell them. Um, but they only, they're only most effective when people are very close to making a sale. Yes. So more than the lower middle to bottom of the funnel sort yes. of stuff. Yeah. Yes. Um, they're also generally told badly. If you, look at, if you look at most customer stories, it's all... Happy, happy, joy, joy, aren't we wonderful? And it is boring. Yeah. Um, I was writing an article yesterday about how a good customer story goes from like before and after. So, you know, before before you worked with Mike, uh, what what were you worried about? Um, what led you to do a Google search for Mike on that yeah. day? What was the situation? What might have stopped you placing an order? So the, the, the purpose of the customer story is to bring objections out into, into the earth, of course. Yeah. Because people listening to it also have those, those objections. And they connect with it. That's me. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. me. That's going off in my life. And then you say, but then I found this was the experience. This has been the outcome. Um, so it follows that structure. It's way more meaty. It's more engaging. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of how you tell a good customer story. You then got personal stories, yeah. which, which is a tricky thing to do because we all worry that we are... When you're telling a personal story, it's a less direct approach. Yeah. It feels like you're... So if you've got the sale over here and you're over here... You kind of take them on a bit of a walk in the park first. Yes. Um, but sometimes you have to do that because often people aren't ready to hear you offer yet or they're, they're not ready, they're not at that level of understanding. They, build up they, just, don't, they just don't trust you yet. Yeah. So they're not ready for it. So they, they need to know who you are and once they understand your story and your transformation, then they're ready to hear the offer, which is when yeah. the personal story comes in. The other type of story you can tell is what I call other, which is kind of a story about basically anything else. Yeah. I've got a few examples of that, which I'll talk about. Brilliant. I'd love to hear those. Um, so these, these, these sort of um, relate to kind of story selection a little bit more. Yep. Um, so, you know, when, when you're thinking about, okay, so when I'm working with a client, most of the time we, we want to think, so immediately when someone first encounters you in your business, what story should you tell first? Should it yeah. be a product or a customer story, which, you know, if you're a plumber or something, it probably should be. Yeah. Um, if you have, if you're a coach or a speaker, then it probably needs to be your own story. So, so what do you say, Rob, on that point? And I've, I've just got a, it's a question, it's, in, it's genuine in its intent. For me, when we're working the inbound side on strategy, and we're looking at content that's being created, and what we mean by content, guys, is anything that we're putting down, either on print or on, on email or on video or graphics. It, it, it's, it's what, you know, think about it this way. The internet would not exist if content wasn't a problem there. So, so anything, videos, text, whatever it would be. So when we look at it from an inbound point of view, I just want to sort of ask your opinion and, 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 and view on this, that we would obviously look at what is the content designed to do as well? So is it, a, is it an awareness piece, say, at the top of the funnel? Is it a consideration piece in the middle of the funnel? Or is it a decision piece at the bottom of the funnel? Now, you've just mentioned something that new, that's new to me, Although I've heard it in through the, 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 the various, you know, whether it's copywriters or, or Don Miller stuff or whatever, but you've sort of gone in there and said, hey, is this a product story is, or is this a customer story or a journey or a personal one? My question is simplified down to, are we looking at what stage the content is at the funnel or, or, or the, the article piece, or are we looking at what type of content it is first, like personal or product? Where would you start with that? I think you have to look at where, I think the place in the funnel is really important yeah. as to where they are at the moment. Because that's, that, then, that then directly impacts what is the most appropriate thing to think. Yeah. You know, the tonality. If, 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 they, if they have a high degree of awareness about the product and they're looking at different brands or whatever, then you know, don't waste time telling me about your backstory. Yeah. You know, that's, that's not going to help at that point. Um, I, I also think that like a lot of content can be enhanced with story as well. Absolutely. Um, so yeah. we, you know, we're doing a bit of work with like Facebook ads at the moment. Yeah. Um, some terrible Facebook ads. Every time, every time I, I scroll through my Facebook feed, I get furious. Just so to, you're the harshest critic. You're looking. I'm, I'm looking through it like, no. <laughs> That's like I do with business. I look at business. I look at the business model, and, I, and I'm sort of. I've shared this on a previous podcast. So if anybody complains, you know, obviously Alistair and really we, myself, Alistair and Jamie went to Boston to the HubSpot Inbound Conference last year. Um, we took a, a leisure day out the first day before the conference started, before the partner day was out there. And we did a Boston bus tour. I'm interested in American history, so obviously, you know, the Freedom Trail in, that, in, in Boston. And I'm actually stuck, sat on the bus 
going around the tour of Boston. And these two guys are obviously taking in the sight. So I'm trying to work out the business model. There's only 16 people or whatever on this bus. How they're making this pay with the overheads, the cost of the driver, or whatever. So I know you reference it as a Facebook ad, but I'm actually looking at every single business and working out what the overhead, the operating costs, how the investment vehicle is working behind it. And that's just my head. You can never switch that off either. <laughs> Can't do it. So I'm a total geek. So if you ever meet me face to face or I come to your business, you know I'm going to be looking, working out what the revenue line is, the gross margin line is, everything else in between, and down to the EBIT at the bottom. But uh, Sorry about that, Rob. I just have to share that with you because I, I, I resonate with it. You're looking at Facebook ads. I'm looking at business models. It's exactly the same. You're critiquing it and you're working them out and you're frustrated with it, aren't yeah. you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think to go back to the question, you, you've just got to understand where, where, where people, people are at in terms of um, like what is, their, what is their current level of understanding and what, what they're looking for. But, um, I mean, just, 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 just to go back to my four types of story, you know, we've got this kind of other category yeah. and it, it takes a bit of explaining. So I've brought in a few, a few different things. So you mentioned earlier that I'm a binge watcher of documentaries. <laughs> so very few of my stories actually come from me. I, I basically, I'm always, I'm always, I'm like, so people think I'm a, I'm a copywriter and whatever, but actually the writing is just the output and the really, the really important part is having the input and storing it. If you've got the input, then the, write, then the writing, you know, you, you can learn how to do the writing. But otherwise it's like you open the blank word document and you, and you don't know what you're going to write about. And that's, that's, where, that's where it falls apart. Yeah. So you have to be storing as you go along. So I watch, I watch well, documentaries anywhere. So uh, we might share, I don't know if you can see yeah, this. So, right. so this is a photo. So this, this is actually a, a screenshot of um, a guy in China. So you can see some Chinese writing on the wall behind him. He's, yeah. he's holding a book. The title of the book is the caption. Yeah, so um, how to help old people live better, longer, and more fulfilling lives. Yes. So he was talking about that book. So would you like to guess when that was first published? Oh gosh, uh, I'm trying to look at the clothes and the fashion or whatever. Um, oh, 95. Okay. Do you want to guess when it was last published? Uh, oh, I I'm going to embarrass myself. If I'm I'll let you give me the answer. Okay. <laughs> the answer's on the back. Oh wow. Wow. 1085 and 2013. So, so yeah, only well, nine, 910, <laughs> 910 years wrong to start with. I told you I'd embarrass myself on the first time. So, uh, but that's awesome. So first published in 1085 and last published in 2013. So that book was published about 400 years before Gutenberg invented his printing press. Wow. So the Chinese have blocked printing technology. Of course. Um, so there's a few things about that story. You know, if I needed a story to illustrate longevity, uh, if I needed a story to illustrate... So if you look at the title, How to Help Old People Live Better, Longer and More Fulfilling Lives, that is an evergreen title. Perfect. If you need, you need the story about evergreen content and the importance of it, I would select that story. So that's an example of, an, of a story. You're just kind of leveraging examples from elsewhere. Like you don't, it's quite, um, it's quite liberating to know that you don't have to come up with everything yourself. So I just want to do a quick reference to a more modern title than the, even that one, uh, Rob, in 2013. Um, you guys who follow Gary Vee, I'm sure if you're in the entrepreneurial space, you'll be in and around that. There's a great piece of advice that Gary Vee's, and I don't know which one of his books it's out of, um, uh, but he talks about, you mentioned earlier, uh, Rob, about opening the Word document and having that sort of writer's block. Um, and one thing Gary Vee mentions about that is that document don't create. So if you document your life uh, or your experiences and then translate those into your content, it's a lot easier to document and produce it than it is to create it from scratch. Now, in a similar example from what you've done there, Rob, what you're saying is, and I suppose I'm just going to dumb this down to my level here, is... Um, you're going to sort of keep your eyes and ears open. You're going to look for real life experiences and you're going to sort of store those away in the documents that are in the memory banks. And yep. then when a piece of content that needs coming up, you're going to go to that as your basically documented source. You're going to translate that over and stitch that in and around the person, the product, the creation or whatever else it would be because it's relevant. Yes. And, and that's it. And that's awesome. That's next, time, fantastic. next time you're creating content, next time you're doing a presentation and you need an example to illustrate a particular thing, it's all, it's all there ready to go. And that's, that's, the, big, that's the big bottleneck in, in, in copywriting is, is having this stuff ready to go and having clarity of what you're trying to say. No, absolutely awesome. That's fantastic. So think about it. With the framework of the strategy I talked about earlier, you know, the four types of story. Uh, we'll get those links put to the bottom, Rob, as well. We'll get them in the, uh, the, the podcast app and the, uh, the YouTube channels and things like that. So we'll put those on there. So that's great, Rob. I really appreciate you, you know, sort of sharing that. And... Um, I think just moving this forward, selecting the right stories, key to maximizing results to help us understand the process, you know, how to get started. 
uh, with the right story. Can you just talk to us a little bit more around that and, um, you know, getting, you know, I know we've talked about that example that you brought in there, but it's maybe a couple more you could share with us and things like that about selecting the right story. Yeah, so when people are selecting stories, I, I, I just uh, model called the story selection seesaw, where on right. one side of the seesaw you've got relevance, and then on the other side of the seesaw you've got unexpected. So Interesting. the ideal story should be relevant but unexpected, right. whereas people just tell expected stories about your products. And, and it becomes vanilla. And it's vanilla, um, and you just end up sound, sounding like everyone else. Yeah. Um, so I've got, I've got um, a picture here. So I took this photo in 2009. Yeah. Um, so this is a town. Yeah, yeah. This is a town called Lamy Bamba in northern Peru in, in the Andes. Um, so I, I, I spent a bit of time travelling in South Peru, America. Yeah. In South America, yeah. And I got the bus. I got I got the bus to Lamy Bamba. I was going to stop there and do a bit of hiking for a few days. Um, and I got on the bus, and about five minutes after I got on, I suddenly realised that I had a lot of US dollars on me, but I only had like a small number of Peruvian coins. I was like, oh no, I'm going to, I'm going to a jungle in the Andes. They are not going to have a bank. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I actually thought about leaving the bus at one point to go to the bank and then trying to run back again. But I thought, oh, I'm, I'm just going to wing it. It'll be all right. So I got there, obviously no bank. And I, um, so I found the hotel and he was fairly laid back. And I, I said, you know, will you take dollars? He was like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> and um so I ended up asking like shop owners, you know, is there any way that I can exchange some dollars for some premium money? Uh, you know, it's like one of those, those films where like a traveler gets stuck in this backwater for years and years That's and doesn't get out and think I'm, I'm going to be stuck here now. Yeah. So I went away and I, you know, and then I found an internet cafe and I said, yeah, come back tomorrow and we'll, and we'll probably have the money for you. Oh. <laughs> like, so come back tomorrow. So anyway, I went away and did some hiking. Um, and eventually yeah, managed to swap some dollars for proving money. So that, you know, that, that's, that's an example of a personal story, but yeah. if you wanted to tell a story about planning, then you've you go. got an automatic segue yes. to use that as a reference yes. point from there. So it's got relevance, but it's also unexpected. Yeah. So it kind of, it kind of ties in that balance. If you've got the, the China book story, if you're looking for a book story about longevity or evergreen, evergreen content, it's unexpected and it's relevance. I mean, yeah, totally unexpected, and that's more relevant than anything there, isn't it? Because I was 910 years out, just on the start point. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. All right. I want to give you another example. So this is going back the other way. I don't know if you're a football fan. Yeah, massive right? Evertonian. Right. So, okay. Yeah. So, um, so this is uh, I, I, I scored a thing called Tramway Rovers. So over the water from over us. Over the yeah. water. Yeah. So for the you're on the posh side of us. On the posh, the side, posh, side, of the posh the side of the river. Side of the Mersey. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is a photo from earlier. Uh, End of last season, um, so Tranmere are like in the fourth division of English football. Uh, well, I thought you were not leaving now, are you? Uh, so, this, so this is James. Oh, this, oh, so right. that photo is James Norwood scoring the winning goal at Wembley to get us promoted. So, if I was selecting stories that purely interested me, awesome. that would be the story that I would select. Yeah. But actually, unless I'm speaking to, if I'm speaking to a group full of Tranmere fans, that's the only story that I'm ever going to tell because because yeah. because we love that we're all over it. But if if I'm speaking to you know, a potential you know customer audience like. I've, I've got to explain too much about the context of the story. I've got to explain about who Shamir is. I've got to, I, actually, the specifics of the story are quite interesting. We had a player sent off after 48 seconds. Oh, we made all the we'd made all of we made all well sorts by half time. They equalized in the ninth minute of injury time oh, in the first so half. So we had extra time. Um, and, and we eventually scored that winner. So actually, it is, it is an okay story, but you've got to explain too much about the context. Yeah. It, it, so it doesn't fit in. It doesn't join in the conversation that's no, not going on. Yeah, there's not much overlap. So, so it's not quite a dark horse, but I think when you search for that relevant and unexpected thing, that's how I try to select stories. Yeah, I mean, there's a bit, there's a bit of a, you, you could also, and, and I'm probably totally wrong here, Rob, you're the expert, not me, but I'm just trying to sort of show or demonstrate to the audience how I would perceive that story as well. Now I know a little bit more about it. Um, we've talked about, you know, living longer and we've talked about the Peruvian coins and now you've made the reference to that uh, football game. And uh, for me, the reference point that you maybe could use that in better is, is if you're ever up against it yes. 
um, and you think, you know, will the rain ever stop pouring on me? You know, think about it. Tranmere, they've worked all season to get to the playoff final. They're, they're down to 10 men after 48 seconds. What on earth did he do at 48 seconds? Straight red or something. You don't want to know. Okay. <laughs> I was so cross. Uh, yeah. But, you know, the full season of nine months, and for our international listeners, you know, the football season in the UK is nine months, and that's all we do and live and breathe it for, for the people who committed to it. Uh, for, so after 48 seconds, having to play 90 odd minutes with 10 men, all the substitutes, three subs by half time, um, you know, for you guys who got it, the squad in the 93rd minute, that minute it went to extra time, so they probably got 30 minutes on top of that. And then probably, you know, whether they didn't go to penalties doesn't look like it. But, you know, if you ever think you're up against it, you could use a Tranmere story to sort of plot, hey, we come out and we were victorious on that game, even with everything stacked against us. So would that be a fair assumption? What you've done there is, remember we were saying that a story forces you to pick a one particular thing. Yeah. What you've done there is you said, okay, I think the story is about this. Yeah. And that's why a story works. Because you say, okay, I'm going to tell the story. The specifics aren't, you know, here or there, but it's, it's about... A comeback. Yeah, a comeback, yeah. The, the, yeah, the underdog there. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, awesome. So, so it, it can still work. It just probably isn't the one that I would select. No, absolutely. And as I said, that's why you're the pro and I do this. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, but challenge yourself. What I would love you to do, guys, is if you want to shoot us a message on Twitter or if you're watching this on the YouTube channel or on the blog, leave us a comment below. Use the hashtag TheOpenMic or hashtag GrowthEngine. What I'd love to do, we'll get pictures of these, Rob, if you can get us there, and we'll put them on there. And I'd love you, if you I'd love you guys to sort of send in references how you think that, um, how do you associate that story? You know, the comeback story, the underdog, you know, the Adam Sandler side of the sort of story. Uh, I'd love to hear your stories. And Rob, I'm sure you'd be happy to sort of give them a, tip, a few tips and guidance yeah, on course, their yeah. input. So if you're actually struggling with anything and, you, you know, you've got that blank Word document there, looking at it right now, and you're thinking, you know, how can I get a story started? Shoot us a message using hashtag the open mic or hashtag growth engine. And um, we'll get that routed uh, uh, to, to Rob. And, um, you know, we, we, we can get that answered for you and get you a little bit of a start. Um, so, you know, we're here to help as well. So hopefully you don't mind with that one. This is one of those things that once you, once you get it, you can never unlearn it. You can yeah. never unsee it. Like if you've got a content problem, this eliminates the content problem because there's always things that, 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 that you can write about. Always. So, so you can never struggle for things to progress about everything. And the quick pro tip is if you live a very uninteresting life and don't go out much, you can always watch the documentaries and get the ideas from there. <laughs> kind of just, yeah, just tell my stories. <laughs> <isn't> <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> just rip so that's our sort of thing. So, I mean, we may have touched on this already, Rob, because I think it's fascinating as we weave in and out of these questions. Um, key elements of successful story uh, in marketing, you know, sort of, you know, what are the key elements? There? Um, so the key elements, um, when you look at like most films, they have ups and downs. Yeah. A boring story only has ups or it has only very shallow ups and downs. Yeah. A down, a real, a really compelling down always involves some kind of internal internal conflict yeah. like should I have done that, should I have done yeah. that? And it's dwelling on those things and that's, that's what you do in the, in the, in the movies. So, so you have to have these ups and downs. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, you end up with these customer stories. I hate where it's all sweetness and joy and up. Yeah. And it's, and it's, and it's boring. Absolutely. So that's, that's, that's one. Um, the other one I'd say to people is, um, I, I, there's, there's, there's probably two more. Um, another one is to open a loop, is to say something and then leave them on it, suspense. Leave them on suspense. So, so add some intrigue, add some suspense. You can start a story and finish it in another email. Yeah. That works quite well. Um, the third thing I say to people is, is you want to reconnect. So, you know, you were saying earlier about the trauma story, being yeah. about comeback. That comeback is your reconnect between the story and the content. So you end the story by saying that the trauma game is a great comeback. And you start your content by saying, if you want to have a comeback in your business, then you need to get in contact with Mike or whatever yeah, it is. Away. And that's, that idea is the glue between the, between yeah. the story and the 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 bricks. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's great. So you mentioned earlier email there. Um, if we wouldn't be on content or copy, uh, you know, and obviously it's not just about email. Copy is everywhere. It's on your website. It's on your brochure. It's on your business card. You know, it's on the sign outside of your building. You know, it's, it's everywhere that we look. It, it's copy, and uh, it should always be relative to what you do or how you help, of course. Um, but what I want to just focus on as we come on to the latter part of this podcast and this question, Rob, is love your expertise and love you to share with the audience and the listeners the power of email and quick win tips for email use and you know i know we've obviously talked about starting and stopping in there but mm -hmm. maybe i'd love you to expand about how we can get some of these storytelling and these quick wins into email i think if you're writing an email what are the what are the decisions you have to make is do you want to start with do you want to open with the story 
or do you want to start with like a line of content to pull people in and then, wow. and then sandwich a story in the middle? So I call it the open sandwich format yeah. or the closed sandwich format. Yeah. So if you think about it, your content is like your bread and your sandwich is like filling. Yeah. Um, and actually, if all you're doing is delivering content, then you're basically asking your audience to eat dry bread all the time. Yeah, and there's no and, filler. And they might eat a bit of dry bread, but they're not going to stick around for very long. You know, if, if, you need to st- if you need people to stick around for, you know, a few months or yeah. years or whatever, then, then you need better filling, basically. Yeah. So in terms of writing an email, you know, you've got two options. So if people know you quite well, I would go straight into the story because people love the story. You can really pull people in. If people don't know you very well yet, you kind of want to give them a clue as to where you're going with it. Yeah. So you might have like a line where you say, okay, this email is going to be about writing better subject lines. But before we do that, I need to tell you a story about, about Tramway Roads or something. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Come back in. So, so you give them a clue as to some, either, some bit of content that they need an answer to, but yeah. go into the story. And that's, that's one thing that you can do with an email. No, that's brilliant. Yeah. What about setting expectations and copy of email? You know, we use the word indoctrination email a lot and where it's getting to know you and set expectations. Um, would, would, you, would you, I mean, this is probably me just asking you an open question. We do use indoctrination in ours. Uh, everybody, somebody opts in, yeah. then we'll sort of, sort of send them something saying, here's who we are, what we ex- what you can expect from us, and, yeah. you know, opt in, opt out, or change your preferences, yeah. especially with the GDPR thing flying around as well. Um, but what's your take on indoctrination? Slightly off script, Rob, but I'm just love your view on it. Do you I think, think it works? Um, yes, I think it's important, especially if you have a unique take or perspective or a unique system that is a little bit different to how people do it. And you need to explain why it's different, why the old way of doing things doesn't work anymore, yeah. why your way does work. Yeah. Then that's where you need the indoctrination sequence. Yeah. Is, you know, it's just kind of a welcome sequence to, make, to get people onto your page. I think it's really important. I have a sort of two week period where yeah. people get emails from me and then I add them into my kind of essentially daily emails. Yeah, like a nurture sequence. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. Um, but I, I think the expectations is really important. So I send five emails a week. Yeah. I tell people that they go out at 9 a.m. UK time. You know, as long as the sun rises, you'll get an email from me. Yeah. It's a weekday. Unless something's gone really wrong at the weekend, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, you'll get an email from me. And it sets that expectation. So it's not just, you know, I'm emailing too much or, or not enough. That's a big question a lot of people um, say. I spoke to uh, Kenda, Kenda McDonald, uh, on a podcast uh, a few weeks ago. And we talked about how many emails is right or wrong and things like that. And um, one um, nurture, well, I think, Kendra, if you're listening, I've got this wrong, I apologize, but I think she called it like a longer term nurture sequence where it's, it's 52 emails, it's one a day. And, you know, we had some comments after that saying, is that really enough? Is that too much? Surely my audience will get fed up, but it goes back to valuable and, 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 and important information, doesn't it? So your take on sending too many emails or not enough emails and, and the relation to the, the, the story and the copy so my, my perspective is that so the benefit of sending regular emails is you force people to make a decision about you. Yeah. You force people to decide, yeah, I like this guy or no, this, this isn't for me. And you know what? The people who decide this isn't for me, they, Segment they, of they were never going to buy anyway. Yeah. So you don't really need to worry about them. The people that you want to build is the people who get your email every day and think, where is this, where is this guy or girl been? Yeah. This is a breath of fresh air. Yeah. And they're the people who end up buying everything that you have. So yeah. you only need to worry about them anyway. So it's not just about building a massive list. It's about the size of your engaged database. Engagement all the way. Um, so my, my, my engaged list only grows fairly slowly because I force people to make a decision about that. Yeah. Early on. Early on. Yeah. Um, I do let people switch to weekly emails. but um, Is it like a roundup? Yeah. So I let people do that. But those, those people are kind of in the backwater. Yeah. They, they don't buy stuff very often. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't spend that much what are you trying to market to them? No. So it's like, a, it's like a filtering system, basically. It is. And, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, even though I agree with the statement, another Dan Kennedy one here, I apologize uh, for, you know, be, you know for, for the similar references. But I think Dan Kennedy has a quote or something like, if 10% of your list ain't unsubscribing, you're not marketing hard mm-hmm. enough. Correct. Um, now, I'm not saying go out and spam everybody. That's the last thing that you should do. Segment, provide value, relevant content, and, and things like that. But using that mentality that don't be fearful about them. If they're on your list and they don't want it, they're actually doing you a favor by cleaning your list. So move them on, isn't it? And if you're providing value. So I've got to ask this question. And I know, again, it's not on script. So I apologize for putting you on the spot. But to send an email a day, and I know we've got some examples of Peruvian coins and Tranmere Rovers and me being 900 years out on a book release and all those things that I'm gonna, you'll never stop reminding me about. But what do you talk about for 364 days or five days a year? Well, this is the thing. So I only really have about 
or five things that I really write about. Yes. Um, but what I do is I illustrate those things with different examples and different stories. Give us an example of that. So, so give us a topic and then an illustration. Rob. So this year, so it's this year, this week, um, I've been writing about different types of story. That, that is one of the things that I write about. Yeah. And I've been I've been ranting away about how most product stories are basically boring. Yeah. Uh, and actually, um, if you go and so for product stories, I recommend people go and look at the Jay Peterman clothing website. Yeah, yeah. It tells great stories about their products and it, it pulls you in as the reader. You imagine yourself using those products, which yeah, is yeah. what a product story should do. Absolutely. Um, and I, I, I recycle that every now and again. I, yeah. I, it's not like I'm trying to find a new topic every time. No, you're just I'm just illustrating different angle. And, and actually, people don't pay attention to every email. No, then, and you're assuming that they don't always see them all. Yeah. So they might just dip in and out of them and go for yeah, and that's And that's fine. Awesome. That's fantastic. Well, I think those are some awesome tips there. Um, so, Rob, I really appreciate you sharing your experience. There's been some real diamond tips in here, and you know, I can't thank you enough. And you know, for the audience, uh, if you want to learn more about Rob uh, and what he does, you can go to truestoryselling.com. That's truestoryselling.com. Um, and you can also sign up for a free seven-day story course on there, Rob, I think, which is, just tell us a little bit about that course yeah. and what they can get if they opt in for So that. that covers sort of the basics of how do you take a story that you want to tell in an email and how do you actually put it in an email so that it's interesting, it has the ups, it has the downs, it has yeah. the suspense, and it reconnects to your message. Awesome. It walks you through that in seven days. Oh, that's brilliant. And that's a totally free course. Yeah. Absolutely. So truestoryselling.com. Uh, um and as I say, I think you've added so much value today, Rob. I, I can't thank you enough. Um, and, it, and it's been a pleasure to learn from you as well. Um, you know, as I say, I've studied various copywriters. You know, we talked about Don Miller off there, but, you know, Drake Bird, obviously Dan Kennedy, Gary Halbert, all the greats. And I know there's some obvious ones for you out there saying, Mike, you're picking the obvious ones. But I generally, you can go to my book stock shelf on there, uh, and they're all on there, all the books. And, and you know, um, I don't, it's more of an interest than it is. Um, um, anything I'm, I'm good at, if yeah, that makes sure. sense. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing the values. There'll be some awesome gems in there. So as I start to wrap up, Rob, um, storytelling in marketing, if we were to pull out sort of three pro tips, if there's just three things that the listeners could do to get an impact, get that result. Now, what would you say for the beginners? What would you say they do? So my first one is to, we've already alluded to this, but it's to con constantly research ideas. Yep. So I use Evernote to store my ideas and yep. to tag my ideas. So I have Evernote on my phone. Yeah. I take Evernote to bed. I take it running <laughs> with me. If I could take it, uh, this is actually waterproof, so I could take it to the shower <laughs> if I really wanted to, because that's when... You know, all of the ideas never come when you're at your desk. They come, no, they come when you can't it. write it down and you're trying to scribble something in the shower bowl. <laughs> That's so another reason. Store them as you go and then you realize. Yeah, back to the document, not create. Yes. But also, it's like me. If you look at a lot of my growth engine pit stop videos on the YouTube channel, they're all done in the car. Yeah. And I know people say, ho, ho, you know, why, why did you do it in the car? It's not safe. It's all done for the you know, GoPro stuff. But... Um, that's where I think best. I'm just sort of, I'm driving, I've got, I'm concentrating on the road, but I'm just talking and, and I'm just, I don't even really listen. It's just totally unfiltered stuff. So I get that. So, so just to recap on that first point, Rob is, is if you could just cover that again, please. So it's to make sure that, you know, you've got some means of capturing inf information. So capturing story ideas when you see them. Yeah. So I will often take a photo or a screenshot of a documentary or if I'm watching TV, I'll take a photo Picture of the screen. Of it. I'll store that photo. It, it doesn't yeah, have to be good quality. Probably. But, you know, these, these things show up, you know, years later in interviews and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> or, an e or an email copy. <laughs> or an email copy. So, yeah, just, just you know, find a way. If, if you listen to a podcast, um, I'll, I'll post the podcast. I'll make some brief notes. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, you, you just have to do it. And you could even just use a voice recorder or like rev.com or even just something on the Apple or your Google yeah. Pixel phone or something. Voice recorders are perfect, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that's pro tip one. What about number two? So something I talk about in my first book, The Multi Nurture System, is that I think you really have to get the right people in the right roles. So the biggest problem that I see is that business owners learn about storytelling and they like the idea of it. And it's not that hard to learn the mechanics of it, but then as business owners, we're busy, business gets in the way, and it doesn't happen. Yeah. So in the book, I've described three major roles. So you've got the product expert, you've got the systems expert, so the person who knows yeah. HubSpot or whatever it is yeah. that you use, and then you've got the copywriter. So you can sit in all three roles. So in my business, I sit in all three roles. Yep. So I'm a business owner, I'm the head cook and bottle washer, head cook and bottle washer, yeah. I make I make them espresso and you know, whatever <laughs> else. But over time you want to get one person dedicated in each of those roles because gen generally if you're nurturing people for quite a long time, you need quite a lot of content. Yeah. If you're the business owner, it's it's quite a big ask. Unless you really love to write, yeah. you probably want to work with a writer yeah. who 
who can take your ideas and you know you just speak to them for a bit and you get it transcribed on web and that 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 is your input and then they take that and they make you know 17 facebook posts yeah. and 20 Blogs emails or whatever, yeah. And, yeah you know preferably block produce it um so that's so that's pro tip too is you know have a think about getting the right people in the right rules yeah otherwise the wheels just fall off if you do. Do and it. you're probably gonna start off bad and get progressively worse yeah, yeah. probably Awesome. And pro tip three, Rob. Pro tip three is to set and communicate a publishing schedule. So yeah. whether you're sending an email, whether you're producing a podcast, whether it's a YouTube video, is to say, okay, so we believe we publish the you know the podcast on Friday mornings, 9 a.m. Yeah. So I send all my emails same time every weekday. You know, if you're sending emails at random times, it, it doesn't catch people on the words. It just makes you look bad, badly organized. So it's a bit like what the DM guys do. DM, by the way, is digital marketing. They, they do like office hours and it's whether it's Thursday evening at whatever, eight o'clock or whatever it would you be. Train the, users. Like, you know, train the users. Yeah, train, yeah, yeah. So I, I think you have to condition people when, you have to encourage like a regular reading habit or a regular listening habit or a regular watching habit or whatever it is. Um, it's also really good for you because if you tell people that the podcast comes out on, th on Friday discipline you and today. on Thursday night you haven't done it, then guess what you're doing on Thursday night? <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've just got your schedule restructured. Yeah. And it's the same for emails. You know, if you tell people, uh, you know, we send three emails, it, you know, don't, don't commit to a schedule that you can't do. If you, if, you send, if, you, if you know you can do one email a week and it's going to be a really great email, yeah. tell people you're going to do that and it, it'll happen. But you have to communicate it. If you don't communicate it, it's too easy to yeah. So just on that point, uh, this podcast will go live on Monday the 20, 20th of August. Yeah, Monday the 20th of August. So that's a commitment. For yeah. uh, Monday's our podcast release. And it's day. not Sunday the 19th. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So, you know, the, the three pro tips there, we'll get those documented down at, uh, below on the blog and the YouTube channel and uh, go from there. So, Rob, thanks again. It's been an absolute pleasure having you uh, on the show. And I think um, there's been so much value there. Uh, as I say, we really appreciate it of it. If you want to get over Rob again, uh, visit truestorytelling.com. And again, you can uh, sign up for a seven day um, story course on there. Uh, any other channels, Rob, do you have a connection on Facebook, LinkedIn, or anything like that? Uh, you can search for True Story Selling on Facebook. Facebook, uh, I have a page on there. Um, LinkedIn, such a Rob Drummond's. Yeah, uh, Rob Drummond on there. So, yeah. Um, and we go from there. So, as always, um, Rob, again, thanks again for the show. Hope you've had some value out of learning how to in incorporate stories in there. And as always, if you want to get in the game, go do the hustle, go make it happen, and we're going to catch up with you on an open mic podcast next week. You have been listening to The Open Mic, brought to you by The Success Hub. To find out more and to get the resources we have mentioned in this podcast episode, simply visit blog.thesuccesshub.io and view the podcast section. Thanks for listening and we look forward to catching up with you in our next episode. This podcast and associated materials is published under copyright to The Success Hub. All rights reserved. No reproduction of this material is permitted.